Let's all stand together. We're going to start a new series today. And I'm going to tell you right up front, and of all days to start this message, all these teenagers up here, right up in the front, you're probably going to have a little bit of giggling going on. Because this is kind of a risque sermon. You, you'll understand. It's out of the book of Proverbs. It's about Solomon. So we're going to just tell it like it is. If it's in the Bible, it's good for us to hear. All right? Amen? Amen. Don't want to get any emails. <laughs> all right? We're starting a new series called Familying, and I spelled it that way on purpose, kind of just to drive home the point of family. Familying, and the title of the message today is Loving My Spouse. In Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen carefully to my wise counsel. Then you will show discernment, and your lips will express what you've learned. For the lips of an immoral woman are as sweet as honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is as bitter as poison, as dangerous as a double-edged sword. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being in this place, for being in our hearts. We thank you for your word that instructs us and protects us. And God, I pray this morning that families will make a deeper commitment, specifically husbands and wives, to one another than they ever have before. Lord, we know that we're living in trying times, and we know that temptation is everywhere. But I pray that we will keep faithful to the vows that we've made to one another, and this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, in this series, we're going to be talking about love and marriage and parenting and kids, and the family, and work, just to mention a few things uh, during this particular series. Now, Proverbs is known as a specific kind of book. Do you know what it is? The Book of Wisdom. Can everyone say that together? The Book Let's say that one more time. The Book of Wisdom. So, when we hear that Proverbs is the Book of Wisdom, it's from God's heart to our heart, to our life. And God wants us to sit up and pay attention, and He wants us to learn. And we have a choice right now. We can uh, tune this out. We can refuse to learn. And if we do, we will pay the consequences of that, as we will see in this message this morning. And uh, so I want us to really ask the Lord to penetrate our hearts with His Word this morning. This particular book, this particular uh, Proverbs right here is really one of the oldest um, transcripts we might have between a father and a son. Solomon writing to his son. Solomon was once called the wisest man who's ever lived. Now, if someone has been called the wisest man who's ever lived, let me ask you a question. Do you think we might ought to pay attention to him? I think we ought to sit up and listen because God gave Solomon wisdom. That's what he asked for. David had wisdom. And we understand that Solomon was, uh, the, the father rather was, was David, and David had wisdom, and he passed that wisdom on to his son. Now, he understood things that really were way beyond him. He understood the affairs of mankind, probably more so than Oprah Winfrey or Dr. Phil or any of those others you want to fill in the blank. They sometimes come across as being wise, but really they have worldly knowledge. There's a difference between worldly knowledge and wisdom. Solomon had wisdom. And he used a lot of interesting phrases in this passage, such as, hear my son, your father's instruction. My son, do not forget. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Now, teenagers, it's real easy to tune your parents out. When you get to be a certain age, it's kind of like, ah, they're dumb. But I can promise you this, and how many of you adults would agree with me, that as you get older, the more you realize how smart and wise your parents were. Am I right? You see, right now, you might think, well, they're foolish, and they don't know what they're talking about, and they're not with it, and they don't understand that we live in a different day and age that they grew up in, and that's true, we do. But you know, the principles of wisdom are the same. To any group of people, to any day, in any age. So here's Solomon, and he wants his son to learn godly, heavenly wisdom. Now, here's what the scripture says. Most of you know this. 
What is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord, right? The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So we take the Word of God and we respect the Lord and we're a little bit afraid of the Lord as well because we know that what He has to say to us is right and it's true. And so we respect who God is and we respect those that God called to write His holy Word. This book has 3,000 years of wisdom listed in it. And Proverbs is what we might call a hands-on book. I mean, it's, it's a book for living, a guidebook for living. In other words, it's practical. It applies to living. I don't know necessarily that it came, contains any new insight or any like, wow, I never knew that was a part of God's plan in it. It's just practical nuts and bolts wisdom. Solomon would say, God, out of all the things that Solomon could have asked for, Solomon said, give me wisdom. More than anything else, I want wisdom in my life. And guess what God did? He gave it to him. What does the Bible say? If any man, any person lacks wisdom, let them ask of God and God will give it to them liberally, right? So if you need wisdom in making a decision in life, the Bible says simply ask God for it and God is faithful to give you that wisdom. That's what Solomon did. He gave him wisdom. And folks, he'll do the same thing for us. Sometimes we read and we say, well, he did that for the people in the Bible, but he's not doing that for people today. How many of you would agree with me that there have been many times in my life, many, many, many times, I've said, God, I don't know what to do, and I need wisdom from you, and God has given me the wisdom. As I followed his lead, he's shown me what I need to do. Has that ever happened to any of you? If it has, would you say amen? amen. God gives wisdom. Well, the book of Proverbs also is a we're talking about nuts and bolts type book. It's a marriage manual as well. And it's a parenting primer as well. So we can find out about how to be a good husband and wife. We can also find out in the book of Proverbs how to be a good mom and dad. There's a British anthropologist by the name of John Unwin, U-N-W-I-N. Very interesting study he did. He studied 80 civilizations that lasted over a period of 4,000 years, studied them in depth, went back historically, found everything he could find about these 80 civilizations. And one common thread ran through all of these civilizations. Here it is. They started with strong moral values and they emphasized the importance of family. Do you think we are, as a country are getting away from the importance of family? We're trying to redefine what it is, but guess what? God's the creator of family. He gets to define what a family is, not us. So over, eight, uh, over 80 civilizations he studied, and here's something that happened. They start off strong. They got moral values. They emphasized the importance of family. However, over time, they all collapsed. They were decimated. They declined. Why? Because the family collapsed within those civilizations. And once the family collapsed, all 80 of these civilizations imploded. Folks, the strength of any country is the family. Why do men get up and go to work for their family? Why do women get up and do what they do for their children, they, for their family, for their husband? It's an important thing we need to understand how God feels about the family. So today's question is this question maybe a couple. How can I make the most of my marriage? How can I make the most of my marriage? And how can I experience a love that will last a lifetime? How can I make the most of my marriage? How can I experience a love that will last a lifetime? Here's the first thing I want you to write down if you're taking notes. Solomon begins with a warning about morality. He begins with a warning about morality. Look again at verses 1, 2. We'll look at 1, 2, then verse 7, then verse 13 and 14. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen carefully to my wise counsel. Then you will show discernment and your lips will express what you've learned. So now, my sons, listen to me. Never stray from what I am about to say. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to my instructors? 
I have come to the brink of utter ruin, and now I must face public disgrace. He's saying right there, if you listen to my instruction, you won't one day say, why didn't I listen? Have you ever been there? Have you ever asked yourself, why in the world didn't I listen to my mom or my daddy? Why didn't I pay attention to someone that God put in my life that obviously had the gift of wisdom, and yet I ignored it? And here's what he says, sexual purity is absolutely required in life, not just in marriage, but in life, period. And he warns his son about this adulteress's house, home. And he said, if you go there, you need to understand, son, that that is a pathway that will lead you to destruction. And he goes on to say that those that go there never come back. You may go there and you may have yourself a good time while you're there, but you're going to leave something there you can never get back. So he's warning his son. Adulterers, he says, have very seductive characteristics. Their lips are as sweet as honey. Have you ever heard the phrase, he's a smooth talking man or she's a smooth talking woman? That's what he's talking about right here. Her lips are as smooth as honey. Her mouth is smoother than oil. That's pretty smooth, isn't it? How many of you boys ever kissed a girl who had an oily smooth kiss? But ultimately, he says, concerning this adulteress, it will bring ruin to your life. We'll see this again in a moment, but he says, she is as bitter as poison, dangerous as a sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead to, to a grave. She cares not for a straight path. She's on a crooked trail. Does that sound like any kind of person you want to be involved with as a believer? Not at all. And so Solomon says, son, it's better in life if you avoid these pitfalls. So he's saying avoid all sexual temptation. Now I'll be the first to say, I know that's not easy to do because it's everywhere. Am I right? You turn on a television, it's there. You open up a magazine, it's there. You get in your car, drive down 45, headed south into Houston. There are billboards that are more risque than some of the horrible magazines they used to put out years ago, still do to this day. But they're more risque up there in public for people to see every day as they drive by. So sexual temptation is everywhere. And believe you me, sometimes I'll have well-meaning senior adults say, well, it's not any worse today than it was when I was a kid. That is not true. How many of you grew up in an era where you didn't see things like we see today on TV when you were a kid or a teenager? I did. We didn't see this kind of garbage on TV back then. We didn't see it. So he says, avoid it. The best you can avoid sexual temptation. You see, we don't have it all figured out. And that's why we've got to be willing to listen to the Word of God and pay attention to the wisdom of God, specifically right here, to the wisdom that Solomon was given by God. There was a husband and a wife, they were at a party and they were chatting with their friends and the subject of marriage counseling came up and the man said, well, we don't need marriage counseling, my wife and I. Uh, you see, she was a communications major in college and I, was, I majored in theatrical arts, so she communicates and I act like I'm listening. So don't act like you're listening this morning, right? Really listen. Don't pretend like you're listening. Really listen and pay attention. And if you decide not to heed, Solomon warns his son and all of us that you will pray, pay the price of ignoring the wisdom of God and you will suffer the consequences of ignoring the wisdom of God. So listen to the advice of godly people that God himself has put into your life. The people in your life should be godly people. A wise person checks on the destination of a ticket before he buys it. You wouldn't go up to the airport and say, I need to buy a ticket. Where to? Oh, it doesn't matter. Just give me a ticket. You want to know where you're going, right? You want to know the destination before you pay for that ticket. Listen, I had a deacon a long time ago, had a drop dead gorgeous wife, blonde haired, Swedish in appearance, blue eyed, and it came out in the paper, he got busted in a prostitution sting where he was trying to pick up two prostitutes at the same time. 
He was a deacon. He lost everything. He lost his respect. He lost his respect of the, from the church family. He lost, more importantly, his respect from his own family. He embarrassed and humiliated his wife. His kids didn't know what to think about a dad who professed to be one thing, but was found out to be completely different than what he professed to be, and he lost everything. This is what Solomon is saying. You may chase that rabbit. You may go down that trail. You may follow the pathway of a wicked woman. Young men, listen to me. You may follow that pathway, pathway but you're going to pay the consequences of that. The Guinness Book of World Records has a couple in there by the name of Percy and Florence Aerosmith. Percy and Florence Aerosmith. Why are they in the Guinness Book of World Records? Because they held two different records. One is they were all, the oldest living couple to be married 80 years. Can you imagine being married 80 years? And they had an aggregate age of 205 years. That's how old they were. An aggregate combined their age 205 years. Now both have passed away, but they left some good wisdom behind. Florence said this, never go to sleep, bad friends. I like the way she phrased that. The Bible says, don't let the sun sit down on your anger or sit on your anger. She said, don't ever go to sleep, bad friends. And then Percy said, never be afraid to say, I'm sorry. I think that's good advice, do you? Never be afraid to say, I'm sorry. Well, I'm not wrong. I'm not so sure that God is that interested in who starts a fight, but I think he's extremely interested in who will end it. Who will swallow their pride and say, I'm sorry, even if it wasn't their fault. Another thing, never regret listening to wisdom. You ignore it, regret will come. If you heed it, you will never regret listening, paying attention, and fulfilling wisdom that you've been given. Listen again, verse 13. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to my instructors? I have come to the brink of utter ruin, and now I must face public disgrace. Have any of you ever asked yourself that question when you didn't pay attention in algebra class? <laughs> Why didn't I pay attention to my instructors? And now I took a test. And now I'm going to be embarrassed by the results of those tests. When I was in high school, I dated a lot of different girls. Can you believe that? I really did. And I had a teacher that uh, he would make fun of me a lot because he'd see me in the hallway with different girls all the time. And one time I took a test that he had given, and he gave, I still got it somewhere. He, he wrote down my score on the test, and here's what he did. He said, algebra, 38. That's what I made on the test, a 38. Girls, 100. And then underneath that he wrote, see which one gets you in college. <laughs> so you, you can put... Uh, your emphasis in life where it doesn't really need to be, right? And that's what Solomon is talking about right here. Listen again. Oh, why didn't I pay attention to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to my instructors? I have now come to the brink of utter ruin, and now I must face public disgrace. If you pay attention to God's wisdom, you'll never have to face public disgrace. Here's the second thing. God's wisdom versus worldly wisdom. Verse 3 again, for the lips of an immoral woman are as sweet as honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end she is as bitter as poison, as dangerous as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lead straight to the grave, for she cares nothing about the path of life. She staggers down a crooked trail and doesn't realize it. Verse 8, stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. If you do, you will lose your honor and will lose to merciless people all, all you have achieved. Strangers will consume your wealth and someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. In the end, you will groan in anguish when disease comes to your body. Make no mistake. You'll see this later on in the sermon. Make no mistake. You just go mess around with anybody and everybody, you're probably going to get some kind of an STD. 
You probably will. And some of them you'll, you'll live with for the rest of your life. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> Verse 12, you will say, how I hated discipline. If only I had not ignored all the warnings. Why be captivated, my son, by an immoral woman or fondle the breast of a, of a promiscuous woman? For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. An evil man is held captive by his own sins. They are ropes that catch and hold him. He will die for lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his great foolishness. God demands a lot of things, but here's one of them that's very clear. He demands absolute faithfulness. Where do you find that? All throughout Scripture. All throughout the Bible, we see that God demands that we be faithful. And God has a certain set of expectations for husbands. He has a certain set of expectations for wives. And He very clearly spells those out. And in the Ten Commandments, God gave Moses a list. And guess what one of them is? You shall not commit adultery. Well, I haven't committed adultery. The Bible says if you look at a woman in lust, you're guilty of committing adultery. You mean I don't even have to commit the physical act and I'm guilty of adultery? Yes, that's what it says. If you look at another woman in lust, you have committed adultery. Now, sexual intimacy outside of marriage, even between consenting adults, is sinful and it's wrong. You may say that's old fashioned, I say no, it's biblical. So it's either the Word of God or it's not. How many of you with this, an amen this morning say it's the Word of God? But the world has come around and cheapened sex. The gift that God gave, they made it into something that God never intended and cheapened it. And they boiled it down to one thing, you know what it is? Oh, it's nature. There's no difference between humans and animals. We're the same. Sex is just a bodily function. That's a lie. The average man in America today in his lifetime will have 7.2 sex partners. The average woman today will have 6.4 sex partners. Women who have five to nine sex partners make up 28.6% of the, the population. And men who have five to nine sex partners make up 25.8%, actually less than women. Folks, we're in trouble. Well, we've got no more morals than that. When we have reduced ourselves to being nothing but animals, do you think you're an animal? Or are you a special, unique creation of God? We know what the answer is. Let me say something. If you're single, wait till you get married. Who invented sex? A lot of people say, well, the devil invented it. It's dirty. <laughs> no. Sex was invented by God. And since he's the inventor of it, then he has the right to tell us how to use it, right? He has the right to tell us their boundaries. And he has the right to say, follow the boundaries. Make sure you stay within the lines that you don't get out of control. And if you're married, then stay faithful. Solomon says, drink water from your own cistern. Let me put that in modern day vernacular. Don't be messing around. Everybody got that? Don't be chasing around. Don't be messing around. Drink water from your own cistern. In other words, men, from your own wife, if you're married. Here's some facts about faithfulness. Facts. Faithful couples are happier than those who are unfaithful. That is a fact. Listen to this. Successful people had faithful parents. Successful people in life, if you study their life, you will discover that they had a faithful mom and dad to the Lord and to one another. Here's the third thing. Some of you are thinking, man, I am messed up. So what do you do if you've already blown it? What do you do if you've already blown it? Verse 15. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. 
Why spill the water of your springs in the streets having sex with just anyone? You should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with strangers. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. Some of you teenagers thinking, I didn't know that was in the Bible. I'm going to start reading it. He's contrasting right here, love. And right here he's talking about married love. He said, married lovemaking is like drinking water from a fresh well. He also saying sinful lust, unmarried lovemaking is really lust making, is like drinking polluted water from a gutter literally translated from a sewer. It's like drinking polluted water from a sewer. So here's what the Bible is saying. Sex within a marriage is like a beautiful river that brings life. But sex outside of marriage is like a sewer that defiles everything that it touches. My best friend who died a few years ago, his wife was still living in the home that they lived in when, they were, when he was alive. But the sewer got clogged up in the, on the city side and it backed up into the bathtub, the shower, uh, the sinks, everything. And it literally spilled over into all of their house. They had to replace everything. Every stick of furniture had to be replaced. All the tile had to be replaced. It contaminated everything. If you think I can separate a sex act from the rest of my life, understand this. If it's outside the framework of marriage, you cannot. It will affect everything, everything else about your life. And young ladies, please listen to me. If a young man ever tells you, if you love me, you'll let me. (laughs) I'm going to say this just as plain as I know how to say it. He doesn't love you. He loves himself. Do you hear me? He loves himself and he's trying to use you. I'd say it a different way, but we've got some small children in here. He's trying to use you. So don't believe that. It's a lie. If you love me, you'll let me. So God's boundaries, he says, gives life. It's like a river's banks. A river's banks keeps the water flowing in the same direction. But if the banks erode, then the water just runs out into the fields everywhere. It becomes stagnant, maybe even turn into a swamp. So the pledge of marriage allows for a deeper relationship. The pledge of marriage creates a more meaningful life for you. And sex outside of marriage is shallow and it will not satisfy you. There's no depth and it's easily stirred up. There's no depth to it. It's contaminated. So don't believe the lie of the devil. Don't believe so much of what we're hearing today is simply not true. So here's Solomon's advice. I love this. Be intoxicated always, you talk about your wife, be intoxicated always in her love. Now that word intoxicate is, it is interesting. Because he's saying right here, if you're intoxicated with the love of your wife, then you're not going to be led astray. No seductress in the world can lure you away from a woman that you're intoxicated with. You won't be looking for greener grasses if you're intoxicated with the love of your wife. Men, are you intoxicated with the love of your wife? You got one man here who is. The, the rest of you are going to have to pay. But I'm going to give you a chance to make it up here in a minute. There was a husband and wife sitting on a porch swing. She was sitting on one end. He was sitting on the other. And the wife looked at him. She said, you remember back when we were courting? That means dating. You remember back when we were dating? You used to sit right next to me on this porch swing. And he said, well, I can do that. And he scooted over next to her. And then a little later she said, you remember when we were dating, you used to take your hand and stroke my hair. And he said, well, I could still do that. And he reached up, began to stroke her hair. And Do you remember when we were dating, you used to hold my hand? And he, he said, well, I could still do that. He reaches down, holds your hand. And, and then she said, do you remember when we were dating? You used to nibble on my ear. And the man got up, started to leave. And she said, where are you going? He said, I'm going inside to get my teeth. 
<laughs> Some of us need to rekindle our relationships and start dating again, our spouse, and treating them like we ought to treat them. Now, I want every married couple here to stand right now. If, you, if you're married, I want you to stand. I'm going to give you a chance, men, to redeem yourself. Husbands, I want you to look into the eyes of your wife right now. No, no one else matters. Take her hands and look into her eyes right now. And I want you to say this to her. Honey, I'm intoxicated by you. When you say it, she's going to think you're drunk. <laughs> Let's hear it. I want to hear it. I'm intoxicated by you. Say it again. I'm intoxicated by you. Say it again. I'm intoxicated by you. Men, that's the way you're supposed to be. Intoxicated by the love that God has given you. Now, Robin, you're down there with our grandbaby. I'm intoxicated by you. I love that pink hair. <laughs> I wouldn't be fair if I didn't say it to my wife like you men did. Stay intoxicated with your wife's love. And if you do, you're not going to be tempted to stray. 